This is part three of the dimensional analysis, chapter five of the book. This is the part three and the last part of this chapter. So, so far we talked about the motivation behind dimensional analysis. Also, we reviewed the fundamentals of uh, the pi buckingham theorem in order to develop or convert a regular relationship between the variables of a problem and convert it to a relationship between the non-dimensional uh, parameters, non-dimensional numbers, pi groups. So in this part, we want to talk, we will talk about some practical examples. In that we want to compare, we want to see how to compare the measurements between models and prototypes. So we said that Oftentimes the prototypes are quite large, like prototypes of, uh, of a ship or of an aircraft. So as a result, models are, models are constructed and tests are performed in the lab in much smaller scale. And then there will be a one-to-one -one relationship between the non-dimensional numbers for the model and for the prototype. But is that that simple? The answer is that no, it's not that simple because from a large scale prototype to a model, not ev it's difficult to keep everything like essentially identical between the two. So here let's review some of the pitfalls. So performing scale analysis, this scale analysis means model prototype, you know, comparison is mathematically straightforward as what we have seen. However, there are several issues to consider. <clears throat> so first, we took for granted the important variables for the phenomena. Selection of important variables is not a trivial task and requires considerable judgment and experience. So in the previous examples, for instance, in the case of the friction force over a flat plate or a sphere, we just said that, okay, force is a function of length or length of scale of the problem, velocity, density of the fluid, and viscosity of the fluid. So if we are given a brand new problem, it's not that easy to figure out what are the important parameters. If someone with not enough experience or knowledge is given that problem uh, or a new, a brand new problem, then it's not easy for them to actually figure out what are the important parameters. Second, typically the Reynolds number of the model is too small by a factor of 10 or 1000. As a result, we end up estimating the desired high Reynolds number prototype data by extrapolating the model data in low Reynolds number. So this may result in high uncertainty in the analysis, but there is no other practical alternative in hydraulic model testing. So, so we said that for this scaling analysis to be valid, <clears throat> the Reynolds number of the model must be equal to the Reynolds number of the prototype. So we do need to calculate the Reynolds number of the prototype in real world application and then use the same Reynolds number for the model. So Reynolds number is rho v d or L divided by mu. So when we use a much smaller uh, model, much a model much smaller than the prototype, then it means that the characteristic length is much smaller. So we would need to increase, for instance, the velocity to compensate for that decrease in the characteristic length. So if the velo if we significantly increase the velocity, then we may actually change the dynamics of the flow. Or we may not even be able to increase the velocity that much. Like if the model is one tenth of the prototype, then we would need to increase the velocity 10 times given that we use the same fluid. So it's it's not it may not be always practical so sometimes extrapolation is done what it means it's given in the next slide 
So here what you see, it's for instance the drag coefficient as a function of the log of the Reynolds number. And if it's not possible to keep the Reynolds number of the model equal to the Reynolds number of the prototype, so the tests may be done at a lower range of Reynolds numbers, so like at this range, and then a relationship will be established between the drag coefficient and the Reynolds number, and then this relationship may be extrapolated to larger Reynolds numbers where the prototype actually operates within this range. So if we simply extrapolate, then we will introduce some error. Therefore, in the design, we need to be careful that this extrapolation is just an approximation and the real drag force may be plus minus like 10%, 20% of what we have obtained here. All right. <clears throat> so some other pitfalls. So after selecting important parameters and determining pi groups, like what we did in the previous lecture, we should seek to achieve similarity between the model tested and the prototype to be designed. So the model and the prototype should be similar, they should look alike. What does it mean? So in general, flow conditions for a model test are completely similar if all relevant dimensionless parameters, all relevant dimensionless parameters have the same corresponding values for the model and the prototype. So if we can keep all dimensionless parameters the same for both model and prototype, then there will be similarity between these two. So for instance, we keep the Reynolds number of the model and prototype the same. If it's a supersonic problem, we should keep the Mach number of both the same. And if there is some like another important parameter, we should go ahead and keep the other important parameter the same as well. However, establishing complete similarity is highly unlikely. So in practice, we may not be able to actually keep all non-dimensional parameters the same. Because you can imagine that you want to keep Reynolds number and Mach number the same, then you should have flexibility choosing, for instance, the dimensions, the properties of the fluids. If you want to use the same fluid, then you really don't have much option. If you can change the fluids, it's usually between water and air. So there is not much flexibility in fine tuning these properties in order to make sure all of the non-dimensional parameters from model to prototype are the same. So therefore, we need to make some compromises in order to be able to do the problem. So we, we said that the, uh, the prototype and the model should be similar. So let's elaborate a little bit on this. So we can think of three kind of similarities. The first and most obvious one is the geometric similarity. Or maybe, I mean, this maybe some people think that this is the only required similarity. So geometric similarity means that if this is your prototype, then your model, your scaled down model should be similar to the prototype. So what does it mean? It means that just shrink it, just shrink it so that all dimensions, angles, lengths, and so on, uh, scale down, you know, at a proportional scale. So just similar. So it's obvious to understand what it means. So this is, so this is essential. This is, so basically any prototype and model should satisfy this condition. So for instance, if you are doing test for a, uh, for a ship, which has that kind of like uh, oval shape, you cannot make a model which is spherical. 
because it's totally different, right? So you cannot expect the results to be <clears throat> to be like uh, related. Okay, so this is geometric similarity. What else? What other kind of similarities we can think of? So another similarity that we can think of and should be equal, hopefully, if possible, is kinematic similarity. So we do have kinematics and dynamics. So dynamics is related to force, kinematics is related to motion. So when we say kinematic similarity, it means that it requires that the model and prototype have the same length scale ratio and the same time scale ratio or in summary, the same velocity scale ratio for both model and prototype. So kinematic similarity means the same velocity ratios between model and prototype. <clears throat> so length scale equivalence actually simply implies geometric similarity. So we say that for kinematic similarity, we do need length scale similarity and time but for length scale similarity it is already the geometric similarity so it means that if uh, we do have time scale similarity then we will have kinematic similarity now the thing is that this kinematic similarity with this time scale is also related to force similarity or related to dynamic similarity so the time scale equivalence or similarity may require additional dynamic considerations as well such as the equivalence of Reynolds and Mach number so if you look at this free surface flow here so let's say this is the surface waves on the ocean so with large waves so oftentimes for free surface flows we when we analyze the free surface flows a dynamic boundary condition is defined on the surface so for ocean waves we do have like strong gravity waves then if we want to have and uh, you see the velocity vector here then when you want to test it in the lab, then when as you scale down the prototype, these waves have to be similarly scaled down and the velocities have to be scaled down as well. So in order to keep this uh, kinematic similarity. And then finally, the dynamic similarity is the similarity between the forces. So dynamic similarity exists when the model and prototype have the same length scale, length scale ratio, that's geometric, the same time scale, that's kinematic, and the same force scale ratio. So dynamic similarity includes all other similarities. So for a, for a model, for a scaling analysis to be dynamically similar, it must be geometrically similar, kinematically similar, and also in terms of force scale, it has to be similar. So dynamic similarity exists simultaneously with kinematic similarity. If the model and prototype force and pressure coefficients, like drag coefficients, and for like friction and pressure coefficients we will see it more in chapter in the next two chapters so this should be identical if the drag coefficients for friction and pressure are identical so it is dynamically similar so this is established not easily so this is established if one for compressible flow, if we want to have complete similarity, if you have co compressible flow, the model and prototype 
must have identical fundamental numbers between model and prototype. So usually these fundamental numbers are Rayner's number. Inertia, force, viscosity is always present in a fluid. So Rayner's number is all, almost always important. Since we do have compressible flow, Mach number is important. And a specific heat ratio if the temperature changes. So, however, as we will see in the following examples, satisfying all three conditions is not or may not be possible. So for now, let's assume that temperature doesn't change, so we don't have to worry about the specific heat ratio. So between Rayner's number and Mach number, for compressible flows, it is more important to satisfy equivalence of the Mach number. It's important to, to put the Mach number of the model equal to the Mach number of the prototype and relax the condition of uh, putting Reynolds numbers equal to one another. Well, this is not something that you can look at the problem and, you know, conclude that this is based on ex experience and many analysis that has been done and this is actually the conclusion of that. So if we do have incompressible flow, so for incompressible flow where there is no free surface, so like incompressible flow in a pipe, water in a pipe, the important parameter there, the important non-dimensional number is Rayner's number. So the drag, the, for instance, the friction loss in the pipe is a function of the uh, Rayner's number and also the roughness ratio, but Rayner's number is mo much more important. So if we do have incompressible flow with no free surface. No free surface means no surf, surf, no in interface between liquid, for instance, and a gas. It's not, it's just, it's an enclosed like fluid such as flow in a pipe. Then Reynolds number is dominant. We need to keep Reynolds number the same between model and prototype. If we do have a free surface, for instance, we are analyzing the forces exerted on a ship. So the ship uh, moves between the interface of air and water. It's partially submerged. So in this case, gravity is an important factor. Gravity comes in the fruit number. If you go back and check the table that we had before. So in this case, Rayner's number, of course, is important. Still, we do have viscous effects and inertia. Fruit number is important because of the effect of the gravity. And in the case of a ship, Weber number, which has the effect of surface tension, is not important. However, in some other cases, for instance, small waves or capillary waves or if you do have droplets surface tension is more important than the effect of the gravity then Weber number has to be used so I, I know that you may actually be confused already so but to summarize we can summarize it this way so let's look at one again so if you do have compressible flow and you want to do the test between prototype and model, you usually go ahead and put Mach numbers the same. If you have incompressible flow with no free surface, it's most important to keep the Reynolds numbers of the model and prototype the same. If you do have a, if in the problem you do have a free surface, fruit number is the parameter that should be considered identical. Usually when you are given a problem, you are told, if it's not obvious, you are told what non-dimensional parameter has to be kept identical. So we will see it in the example that we will do in the rest of this lecture. <clears throat>
All right. So the first one is problem five four. So when tested in water at 20 degrees C, flowing at two meter per second and eight centimeter diameter sphere has a measured drag of five newton. What will be the velocity and drag force on a 1.5 meter diameter? That's the prototype weather balloon. So it's the weather balloon is 1.5 meter diameter moored in sea level standard air under dynamically similar conditions. Okay. So we do have a prototype which is a balloon, a spherical balloon, 1.5 meter. And then we want to, in order to find the drag force on this actual balloon, we want to do a test on a eight centimeter diameter sphere. And instead of air, we're gonna use water. So this is good. So this is actually the first example that we change the fluid as well. <clears throat> So, therefore, we need to know the properties of water at 20 degrees C. We can find it from, it's, assume that it's given. So, the density and viscosity of air at 20 degrees C given. And for sea level standard air, we can also go ahead and find the density and viscosity. So just in the previous slide, we said that for such problems, so this is an incompressible problem. So the Raynor's number is the dominant and non-dimensional number. And if we want to keep the drag coefficient identical between the model and prototype, we need to keep the Raynor's number the same for between my model and prototype. And in fact, if you remember from the previous, previous uh, lectures, for this simple case, the drag coefficient or friction drag coefficient, when it's only because of friction, is a function of Raynor's number only. So this, in this problem, therefore, we do need to keep the Raynor's number the same between model and prototype. And if we do that, then the drag coefficient for the model and the prototype must be equal as well. All right, so if we go ahead and calculate, so some of the variables are given here. If we go ahead and calculate the Reynolds number of the model, so we do have the velocity two meter per second and we do have the properties of water. So Reynolds is rho VD divided by mu. These are properties of water because for the model we are using water. And eight centimeter sphere and viscosity of water. So we find Reynolds number of the model and put it equal to the Reynolds number of the prototype and substitute the properties of air, uh, density, diameter of the prototype, 1.5 meter, and then viscosity of air. This e e equality will give us the actual velocity of the balloon, the velocity of the prototype. So the velocity of the prototype is found here. So now the next so based on this calculation, the Reynolds number of prototype and the model are identical. So now we can go ahead and put this coefficient f over rho v squared l squared for model and prototype uh, identical, equal to one another, okay? 
So the two spheres will have identical drag coefficients. Why? Because they have identical Reynolds numbers. So CD of the model is force divided by density V square over D square or one half. You can, so oftentimes we do have a one half here. I do not have proper tools, but this doesn't matter if you do put one half here or not because it will cancel out. So CD of the model is the force divided by rho v squared d squared. You do have the force of the model, which was measured as 5 and newton. So we can, we do have all of these parameters variables here. And then if we put it equal to the CD of the prototype, everything is known except that the force which is exerted on the actual balloon, on the prototype. So with this equality, we can go ahead and find the actual force exerted on the balloon, 1.3 Newton. So this was, this is a type kind of problem that you should expect, for instance, to see from this chapter. This is highly practical. It, it need, in order to be able to do this problem, you would need to know everything else that we covered so far in this course non-dimensional numbers, uh, the concept itself, the pi groups, similarity, how to you know use the properties and so on in order to do a scale a scaling law analysis. Okay, so let's do another problem. Seven four from chapter five, we do have a one-tenth scale model, one-tenth scale model of a supersonic wing tested at 700 meter per second in air at 20 degrees C and one atmosphere, like it's being tested in a wind tunnel at atmospheric conditions. It shows a pitching moment of 0 0.25 kilo newton meter pitching moment so we need, we need to know what is pitching moment so i have added this schematic here pitching moment that's what we uh, this is what is covered in the next chapter next in actually chapter seven even though we will not go to the details so if you Consider this body as a wing. This is the velocity, the free stream velocity, the velocity approaching the wing. So if this is the wing, this is the velocity approaching the wing. And then we can think of the drag force, lift force, and also three moments. So the moments up, which are applied on the aircraft, one of them is the pitching moment which is it's the moment that actually changes the nose of the aircraft, nose up, nose down. That's because of the pitching moment. And then we have the rolling moment exerted on the aircraft and also the, the yawning moment. So, all right. So here we want to, and obviously the most important one is the pitching moment because uh, that's the one that controls the lift. <laughs> so the pitching moment is given. If Rayner's number effects are negligible, so the problem itself is helping. The problem statement is telling us the Rayner's number effects are negligible. So don't worry about Rayner's number. What will the pitching moment of the prototype wing will be flying at the same Mach number at eight kilometer standard altitude. <clears throat> so we have done some tests in the lab using a wind tunnel and we have measured the pitching moment. Now we want to see what would be the actual pitching moment exerted on the actual wing. If it's flown at eight kilometer standard altitude, it's kind of a cruise flight. So eight kilometers is like about 25,000 feet. 
Okay, so all right, so here we do have like the pitching moment and the pitching moment. So I have written this here. The the pitching moment coefficient can be can be uh, thought to be a function of Reynolds number and Mach number. <clears throat> Even based on the what's given in the problem, you can actually guess that, and based on what we had in the previous slides. But the problem said that forget about Reynolds number; its effect is not dominant. The effect of the Mach number is more dominant because it's a supersonic wing. All right, so. Then the moment coefficient is a function of the Mach number. However, what is how to define the moment coefficient? This has to be given to you, and it's given here. So this is the, you can assume that this will be given. The moment coefficient is equal to the pitching moment divided by rho density v velocity squared l, like the. Uh, characteristic length of the wing cubed so this could be for instance the cord length or another dimension of the of the wing so this must be a function only of the okay so this this uh, sorry this moment coefficient is therefore given moment divided by these variables okay <clears throat> so we know that therefore the moment coefficient of the model and prototype should be equal provided that the Mach number of model is equal to the Mach number of the prototype <clears throat> so fine so we go ahead with the Mach number of the model that we can find the velocity of the model divided by the speed of sound in air at the given condition. So these are also given. We can find them from table A6. So for each given air uh, density, <clears throat> temperature, and pressure, we can find, we can have the air, we can have the speed of sound. It's also given in terms of the altitude. Because in different altitudes, the density, temperature, and pressure changes based on a not very, uh, not based on not a linear you know, relationship, especially for the temperature. <clears throat> okay, so this speed of sound in the air is therefore given from the tables. So we go ahead and find the Mach number of the model. 700 over 340, 2.6, 2.0, 2.06, the Mach number. We put it equal to the Mach number of the prototype in order to find the speed of the aircraft or speed of the prototype based on this analysis. So usually the speed of the aircraft is given and then we need to go ahead, go back and find the speed of the model. But here the speed of the model is given, so we need to find the speed of the prototype. So therefore, speed of the prototype is found based on the equality of the model and prototype. <clears throat> okay, so now the Mach numbers are equal we can go ahead and put the coefficients of pitching moment for model and prototype equal. So m over rho v squared l cubed are equal for model and prototype. When you put this equal, then you can find the moment of the pitching moment of the prototype according to this equation. So this is nothing but putting the coefficient of, so this is like mp, divided by this term in the numerator so rho p v p squared l p cubed so that's the 
moment <coughs> coefficient of the prototype, which is equal to the moment coefficient of the model. So everything else is known, and when you substitute the numbers, you can find the pitching moment of the prototype. All right, so this is another good example from this chapter. So <clears throat> so as you see, because it's not really possible to satisfy the condition of both the Reynolds number and Mach number of the model and prototype equal, we released the requirement for putting the Reynolds numbers the same as well. Because if you put, so now you can go ahead and calculate. If you calculate the Reynolds number of the model and prototype, you have all of the, everything that you need. Well, viscosity is not given here. You can go and choose, find it from the tables. If you calculate the Reynolds number of the model and prototype, you will see that they will not be equal. Because essentially it's not possible to satisfy both conditions. So we go ahead and satisfy the condition which is more important. Which one has more priority? For instance, you have some limited amount of time. So you have some one day, you have one day. So let's say the day after today you have it and then the day after you do have an exam. So and if a friend asks you, for instance, uh, to go somewhere to have fun. So you need to decide which one has priority. So this is exactly the same thing here. So we put equal the parameter, which is more important. Oftentimes it's based on, again, based on experience and based on knowledge that many other people have gained over many years. And we reviewed some of them in the previous slides <clears throat> okay so the last problem that we want to go over from this chapter is problem 80 of chapter 5 we do have a prototype ship which is 35 meter long so it's a ship free surface ship free surface flow you should immediately think of like oh free surface flow what's the important parameter What's the important non-dimensional number? So under design, so the ship has been designed to cruise at 11 meter per second. Its drag is to be simulated by a one meter long model. One meter long versus 35. So it's like a one over 35. Uh, the length, the 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 the, the, the scale down, the scale ratio. <laughs> So the model is pulled in a tow in a tow tank, like in the lab. So for fruit scaling. So the problem actually tells you what is the important non-dimensional number here, because as I said, it's not trivial. So for free surface flows, fruit scaling is the most important parameter to be satisfied. For fruit scaling find a find a the tow speed so if root number is to be equal between model and prototype what should be the the tow speed in the lab given that the, the ship speed is 11 meter per second so what should be the speed of of the of the model in the lab and b the ratio of prototype to model drag so the ratio of prototype to the model drag so the ratio of the drag forces and the ratio of prototype to model power this is a very good question all right so this is the solution that you see here but before that I have added the definition of the fruit number. Fruit number is velocity squared over G gravity, gravitational acceleration, L that the length scale. <clears throat> and CD, the drag coefficient is the drag force, this D or F, divided by one half or 
just beta 1 half density velocity squared times surface area or length or characteristic length squared so this area is like a length characteristic length squared so keep that in mind and we can just judge or guess that cd the Dirac coefficient in this case must be a function of the fruit number which has been told by the problem and also Reynolds number because essentially anytime that you have a fluid flow Reynolds number is important unless you know like some special you know cases for instance so but since it is not possible to satisfy the equality of both fruit number and Reynolds number between model and prototype and as the problem has suggested we only consider the effect of the fruit number which is the dominant parameter here so so after all the 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 Reynolds number so the flow of the, the ship uh, the flow of the ship in the ocean of course Reynolds number is important but fruit number is the dominant so let's keep it this way okay so if we want to keep the fruit number the same let's see what will happen so first of all let's define here the parameter which is used often in this solution alpha is the length scale ratio alpha is 1 over 35 the size of the model compared to the size of the prototype is 1 over 35 so alpha is l of model divided by l of the prototype which is 1 35 so if you now go ahead and keep put the fruit numbers of model and prototype equal and based on the definition here so in the solution velocity is shown by v in this definition the velocity is shown by u so these are the same thing so these are the same thing if you put them equal then you can see that the velocity of the toe so this velocity of the toe is the velocity of the model is related is equal to vp velocity of the prototype square root of the characteristic lengths which is 1 over 35 and if you substitute the numbers for alpha and for the velocity of the prototype we find the velocity of the model what should be the tow velocity 1.86 so as we put fruit numbers of model and prototype equal we find the velocity of the model so we need to pull the model in the lab at a velocity of 1.86 to create a condition similar to the real condition of the ship in the ocean where it has a cruise velocity of 11 meter per second <clears throat> so now that we kept the fruit numbers the same we can conclude that the dry coefficients of the model and the prototype are equal because fruit number of both are equal so the next step is to put cd of the model equal to the cd of the prototype so if we do that then we can find the ratio of the forces so this d that you see here drag force in this problem has been shown by f the force the drag force f is the d that you see in this in the definition of the drag coefficient so if you put cd model equal to cd prototype you can go ahead and find the ratio of fm to fp in terms of the ratios of the velocity which does have a square and this area which is actually a characteristic length square that we do see it here so this is lm squared is in fact a squared lp squared is ap squared and also the ratios of the velocities squared because we do have it in the definition here <clears throat> so if we substitute the numbers 
in terms of alpha that we have uh, found in the in the previous parts of the problem then you see that the drag force exerted on the model divided by the drag force on the actual prototype is 1 over 42,900. So that's the ratio of the drag forces. So in the lab, when we measure the drag force, like using like experimental instruments, then we can conclude that in the real ship, the drag force will be 42,900 times larger. <clears throat> then what does it mean? It means that when you want to design the engine for the ship, that engine should be capable of providing enough force in order to overcome the drag. But what is also important is the power of that engine. So power, and that's another part C of the problem. So power takes into account the force, the drag force, and also the velocity. At what velocity you want to provide that force? So if it's a steady, like constant speed uh, condition, the drag, the power of the engine is equal to the force multiplied by the constant velocity. <clears throat> So as a result, you can go ahead and find the ratio of the power of the model to the power of the prototype based on this equation. So power PM over PP is equal to FM times VM divided by FP times VP. So that's, it doesn't mean that the the we are not putting the powers of the prototype and model equal they are not equal they are dimensional variables we just find the ratio of the power of the model to the power of the prototype uh, by multiplying their forces and their speeds so then we find that it's going to be this number one over two hundred fifty four thousand so the power of the model with respect to the power of the prototype. All right, so this brings us to the end of this lecture and to the end of this chapter five of the book, Dimensional Analysis. So feel free to comment, you know, under this video if you have questions or use the video use the course forum or send me an email if you have questions so you are this chapter has some other parts for instance another method in addition to the pi buckingham method for dimensional analysis there is another method also mentioned in the book but you are only responsible for the content which has been covered with focus on like like problems that we did in the end of the chapter like how to scaling laws like uh, analysis like model prototype testing you know this kind of use practical you know engineering problems so we also covered that how to make uh, governing equations dimensionless that's for your information you are not responsible for it in the test and that's something that's an advanced topic which will uh, those who will continue to graduate studies will see it later. Uh, Non-dimensional, like Navier-Stokes equation. So, but it's, I mean, you, you should understand it, but you are, you should not, ex you are not required, you know, to, you will not be given questions on how to use non-dimensional equations and things like that. It's, it's an advanced topic. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. So this brings us to the end of this chapter.